Um, and so, and theogen fits the bill. I, I, I would have to say that it's become widely accepted in the ethnographic literature. It's become the predominant term, in fact, in, in Spanish uh, in general, but it hasn't gained any type of a, uh, acceptance in the medical community nor among chemists and pharmacologists, but that's not surprising. It wasn't designed for them. Okay, I want to also place you a, a, a little bit more in historical context. Uh, you mentioned your teacher, one of your teachers, R. Gordon Wasson. Yes. Now, R. Gordon Wasson sort of discovered for the modern uh, world, our modern world, uh, the mushroom. Yeah. Yes. Gordon Wasson was a banker from uh, born in Montana, uh, worked in, lived in most of his career, worked in New York. And he and his wife, who was a Russian physician, embarked on a study of the linguistics of mushroom names in the 1920s. Uh, which they pursued very diligently over many years. Uh, and by the time uh, the 50s drew around, they discovered uh, the use, the surviving, uh, rediscovered, I should say, the surviving use of what we now know to be psilocybin mushrooms in Oaxaca. And it was on the, the night of the 29th through 30th of June, 1955, that Gordon Wasson, together with his photographer, Alan Richardson, first became the first outsiders on record intentionally to ingest these psilocybin mushrooms in a shamanic ritual with the Mazatec shaman Maria Sabina in the state of Oaxaca and Huautla de Jimenez. And uh, this really, two years later, Wasson published, an, uh, uh, he and his wife published an important book called Mushrooms, Russian History, which has had literally no impact on history in general because there were only 500 copies and uh, it has uh, very difficult to get it sold for as much as ten thousand dollars a copy now but that uh, simultaneously they published an article in life magazine rather gordon wasn did and valentina his wife published an article in this week magazine the sunday supplement the same week uh, and it was it were these two articles especially the article in life which was called seeking the magic mushroom which really brought this to the attention of the world and catalyzed uh the psychedelic 60s although mescaline had been known since 1896 it hadn't uh, been used much beyond fairly small and esoteric circles, mainly in Europe and secondarily in the United States. The LSD was discovered, its effect was discovered in 1943 and that the properties, extraordinary potency and properties of it were published in 1947. Uh, these were sort of waiting in the wings uh, there and ready, but it was this article in Life magazine, as far as we can tell, that really catalyzed this modern interest in use of these substances. And that started uh, for a time also the rush to Mexico and uh, by the by tourists interested in the mushrooms and the mushroom experience. And uh, I remember correct. one of the uh, poignant thoughts of your book uh, on ayahuasca analogs is that you hope um, as part of your work to turn off the tap of tourism Yes, as we can make these things ourselves without leaving our own backyard. So. Yes, exactly. Um, when Wasson published the Life magazine article, he changed the name of the village, he changed the name of the people, he changed the name of Maria Savina. But in Mushrooms Russian History, the actual facts were given. And much to his surprise, within a couple of years, large numbers of tourists on their own initiative were going to Wautla, neighboring villages, and uh, they drew the wrong kind of attention to this phenomenon. Uh, suddenly, um, the government had stationed garrisons of soldiers and police, and while they were deporting busloads of foreigners, Maria Sabina and other shamans served jail sentences in Oaxaca City for allegedly pandering to this mushroomic tourist trade. And the mushrooms were illegalized in Mexico, and, and bad political attention was attracted to them. Now that that eventually that tourism eventually waned largely because it was found that the mushrooms grew all over the world. And by the mid 70s, myself and uh, some of my colleagues had published books and uh, not only on how to identify the wild mushrooms that grew in North America, Europe, Australia, the South Pacific, and so forth, but books uh, describing very uh, simplified and efficient methods for cultivating them, which gave rise to uh, a truck farm sort of black market production for these things which has been very much refined and that put an end to this mushroomic tourism now we're seeing the same kind of thing in south america 
uh, what I call ayahuasca tourism, especially developed in Peru, secondarily in Ecuador, and rudimentarily in Brazil. And uh, this is most unfortunate because there's presently no stigma whatever attached to ayahuasca in South America. But it will only take, uh, and I might add that wh whereas the mushroomic tourism was ad hoc, it was more or less uh, individuals on their own initiative, now there are uh, people organizing tour groups and advertising in magazines like Shaman's Drum and Magical Blend, and uh, there are fairly sophisticated operations uh, around this ayahuasca tourism. And it, it, it will only accelerate the degradation of these traditions, uh, however inevitable that might be, in, in situ, attract the wrong kind of political attention, cause uh, legal problems for the shamans that use these uh, things like ayahuasca traditionally, and we know now that the, it is possible to make analogs of ayahuasca. It is possible to make ayahuasca from other plants that grow on other continents, and there's really no reason for this. And I feel that if people could make, the, make this themselves, not only would they not wish to spend $3,000 going on an ayahuasca tour, but they would also uh, probably have a more serious use. They would, uh, in, rather than seeing it as a type of commodity that you pay to get access to, they would establish a personal relationship with growing the plants, learn how to process them themselves, and I feel in general this would be conducive to more satisfactory experiences. You also uh, worked um, sort of with Albert Hoffman, who discovered, accidentally discovered LSD, and you translated his book, his original book, into English, LSD, My Problem Child. Yes, in, uh, uh, the German edition came out in 79 and the English in 1980, and that's still in print in a paperback edition from Karcher in Los Angeles. Okay, so I think that establishes you in, uh, in C2, if not in history. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. Um, is what you're studying, what you're bringing out, uh, worthwhile, a worthwhile addition to our culture, or is this uh, unleashing a destructive force? Well, that's a hard question to answer. Uh, it's not for me to say, perhaps. Uh, certainly, I think it's a worthwhile addition to our culture. I think it's the I see, I see entheogens in this uh, end of century, end of millennium decade as a sort of, I call it a healing balm for the lesions of materialism. Uh, I see it as being about the only hope we have for reducing or reversing rather the destructive uh, trend that is so evident in the world today, ecological destruction, habitat destruction, uh, species extinction. Um, I think the only the only thing that really holds out sufficient hope for for reversing that is the entheogenic experience. So in that sense, I feel it is definitely a positive cultural influence. On the other hand, I would say that uh, the, in part what I call the pharmacratic inquisition or the suppression of the use of plant sacraments or entheogens historically is very, has very much to do with the fact that these represent a threat to authority, uh, to hierarchical power structures and centralized authority systems, and they very accurately perceive this as being a threat to them. And so in that sense, it's subversive and uh, is destructive to the powers that be. How would you describe the entheogenic experience and what it can add or subtract in your life? Boy, is that a big question? Right, yes, it is. And I, well, I will preface it by saying I can only describe it for myself. And I, I know that uh, this experience is very variable, both uh, in any one individual and from one individual to another, even talking about the same plant or plant extract at the same dose in the same physical setting, same time of day, whatever. Uh, there's a considerable individual variation, and, and I will underscore again, I'm only speaking for myself. But if I were to try and put it into scientific terms, I would say it enables one to see the universe more as energy and less as matter. Uh, that's why I see it as being a healing balm for the lesions of materialism. It's, uh, the, the concept of hallucinogen is totally wrong in, the, in that uh, 
it presupposes that when one takes a substance like this, it's distorting perception to such an extent that one sees hallucinations,